Welcome to episode 101 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. This episode is part of my series, Dad Talk, and I've invited Dylan Griffith to have a chat. What's this series about? Glad you asked. I'm inviting everyday dads on the show to talk about what's important to them. Episodes may range from a little bit of Liberty Talk to a whole lot or even none at all. This series is all about raising the voices of dads and listening to what they have to say. And that means you may hear some dads discuss ideas that you disagree with. That's okay. Their voice is important and you cannot raise the voice of another if you spend time shutting them down. In this episode, Dylan Dylan and I chat casually about our experiences raising children. Let's dive in and hear what he has to say. All right, so here we are. I have Dylan Griffith here with me on Liberty Dad Dad Talk, and we're just going to be talking in general about being a dad. And so, Dylan, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing great, man. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. Um, it's it's good to finally be chatting with you. Absolutely. And so, let's see. Let's start off with you're a dad. So, tell me a little bit about you being a dad. Me being a dad, yeah, I don't know, man. So I have um, I have a daughter and a son. Uh, okay. My my daughter is uh, college aged, and uh, my son has just turned five. So mm. a little bit about me being a dad. I'm constantly straddled between those two extremes, right? Right. And uh, dealing with the massive amounts of crazy teenage drama that is at times seems life destroying, and then all the cuteness of having a five year old, which is just super awesome. Right. It's a nice balance, yin and yang. I hear you. No, I, you know, I feel like I'm going to hopefully be able to, re, you know, we'll be able to relate in this episode. My son is not quite five. He's just turned three and we just had his birthday party and he's been doing this new thing. I, I don't know if I would say doing, cause that sounds very intentional, but, uh, he will sometimes just, um, freak out and just go berserk. And I like to joke and call it, you know, there's a there's a particular gif that I like to use where it's Godzilla taking a house and just 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 rah, just throwing down the house like the whole house in Tokyo, right? And I'm like that that's live footage of my actual son when he gets angry, which is not very often, but it's like wow, on a dime just <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, kids they have those extremes for sure. I've been pretty lucky. Like uh, mm-hmm. Nico, that's my son's name. Okay. Yeah, he, uh, he's never had like big freak out sessions, but also I'm a little bit of a robot, so hmm. I don't know. He might just get some of that or something. Right. But uh he, he we're definitely like now that we're getting into the five, there's like these kind of hormonal fluctuations mm-hmm. where it's not like freaking out, but he gets emotional. So like something that is just a little hiccup in the day right might make him disproportionately upset. Yeah. So we're going through that right now. But otherwise, he's a great kid. I have no complaints. Oh, yeah. Same here. I mean, he's love my son. I wouldn't trade anything. Uh, maybe in the moment when he's having a, a meltdown, maybe I'll trade that <laughs> moment right in the moment. But afterward, I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to trade anything because it, it is quite the learning experience anyway, just because I try to be thoughtful about it and just like, all right, what happened? What, you know? Uh, so for instance, today, um, We did a bunch of moving yesterday because my wife was in real estate. Uh, She's an investor slash real estate agent. And so there was a bunch of furniture that needed to be moved between some houses just to kind of reorganize some things, you know, different things going on. And so we ended up inheriting a bigger TV uh, that hangs on the wall. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm going to install that today, uh, hanging on the wall. And so I have one of those old speaker, like 5.1, 7.1 surround sound speakers, like the big, you know, the ones that come with the big, huge box and the dial on Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's a little on the old side. And uh, so he comes in, he's, I I usually let him play with my tools and I just kind of keep an eye on him. And he grabbed my, um, my drill, which had a drill bit in it. And I was like, be careful. And I, you know, I just let him. And then the next thing I, I hear it and I look over and he's drilling into the center speaker, <laughs> like literally into the mesh that's on the front. And the mesh is winding up around it. So I was like, stop it, get out. And I, I kind of yelled at him and that uh, he goes running out. And then I was like, all right, well, hold up. So I went and I, I caught up with him. He didn't freak out this time, but sometimes, you know, if, if he feels like he's getting in trouble, he'll really freak out. Um, so, but, uh, see, he actually handled it pretty well. Yesterday, when someone told him to get out of the street because we were moving stuff around, you know, packing it up, 
he uh they were just like hey get out of the street buddy it was really nice like not even mean and then he just started running and crying that was <laughs> so, it yeah so it's you know one moment he may he may break down and it could be over something trivial or you know seemingly trivial or it could be over nothing identifiable uh, identifiable or he might might just go on about his way like it's hard to say what you're gonna get yeah yeah, it's definitely an interesting thing being a dad. Well, just having kids in general, I guess it's not even any easier on the mom side of things. You just right. like have this tiny, at times completely irrational creature that you, for at least the first few years, have to try to to communicate with right. voicelessly, right? Discern their every thought and need, and uh, then in those later ages when they can still communicate to some extent, you're still just dealing with like a ball of random emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. this is a little little agent of chaos floating around your house. So, so since you've been through uh, having a girl and a boy, um, do you see a huge difference between the two? At, at, at least at the age of three, four, five, around that toddler age. Well, so for my daughter, I was not around then. So that's my stepdaughter. Okay, my gotcha. wife's a little older than I am, but. Fair um, uh, so I have. Well, I, I came in right around the uh, the peak teenage drama years on my oh. daughter. So my experience of uh, having a daughter has been one of just dealing with all those things, right? Like right. The crazy interests and like obsessive things and just normal mm -hmm. teenage kid drama. Yeah. Right. So I don't recommend it. <laughs> and if you have like a skip card or something, you just throw it down at 13, jump to 18, get on with right. your life. No, I hear you. I, I hopefully my sister is not watching, but I do remember her when she was thirteen, um, and I always joke and I like to say that was her. You're ruining my life. Age. Yeah, yeah. You know, everything was just ruining her whole life. Yeah, I mean, I had a sister uh, too, so she and I kind of grew up together. I don't think that she was a big pain in the butt when she was uh, young, and I was definitely a pain in the ass child. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult for me to gauge other people. Right. Yeah, I don't know whoever would have wanted to hang out with me. Wouldn't have made any sense, especially right. as a teenager, like a wild chaos mm -hmm. agent going around doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So, I'm probably not the best gauge for what normal looks like in a teenager. But right, yeah, it's kind of funny because um, I was pretty wild. My sister wasn't. My brother definitely wasn't. He was way chill. And sometimes with my son, when he's kind of you know having a meltdown or just being really wild. Like sometimes he's just being wild or what I like to call being a little boy. And uh, I'm just like, so I'll, my mom is not around. So she passed, uh, you know, 2016. So I'll text my aunt and I'll be like, was I like this when I was, you know, younger? And, you know, I was like, do I need to send a prayer up to mom and just be like, I'm so sorry <laughs> for whatever yeah, I did. I'm, I'm really fortunate that, uh, you know, both of our parents are still alive, you know, and we have a good relationship with them um, and they live close. So mm -hmm. Nico gets to spend a lot of time with, with all of the grandparents. Oh, and that's he kinda, nice. he, so he, he stays with Amy's dad for some period of time through the week. And that keeps us from having to send him to uh, like a daycare or anything. Now Amy works from the house anyway, so okay. that would never really be an option if we mostly, well, we do just homeschool. So he's going to be either with us or with a member of the family period, but Gotcha. It's nice. We've been fortunate to be able to keep Nico just with family. It's really good. And I think that's, if you can swing it, that's like an experience that you want, especially for your younger kids. And with the way, you know, parents are often getting older around that time, it's not always an option. That kind of sucks. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, so you said you homeschool, like, did, uh, did, did you homeschool uh, both of your kids is, the entire time? Yeah. So, so again, kind of just came in right at the teenage years uh, <laughs> with my daughter, but um, we definitely did homeschool her. So it, it's been interesting because we're doing the younger kid stuff now, but right. we started with the older kid stuff, right? Like we started with basically what was college um, mm -hmm. classes that we were trying to craft and teach. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting experience because we had the opportunity with Reagan, that's, that's my daughter's name, to uh, to dive into the really fun stuff that maybe you yourself are interested in. And there just happens to be somebody that you're going to be teaching that to. So we went into like, um, what did we do? We did Jordan Peterson's maps of meaning course. Okay. 
And we went through that like self-authoring program that he did. And she went through and she did that. And we went through all of his lectures, the whole Maps of Meaning lecture series and had papers to write about each of those. And, and she and I would meet like once or twice a week and talk about it. So it was pretty cool. Got to do some more advanced stuff. I know uh, Amy was going through some of the economics lessons and things. And right now, Nico on the other end is just starting the Ron Paul curriculum. Okay. So he's working his way through that. Mm -hmm. It's doing pretty good. He's, he's awesome. Super smart kid. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, my wife's more conservative, so she's not quite, and she's from Indonesia. So I don't think that, uh, I think her experience has kind of largely been you like, you, you go to a formal institution to be mm -hmm. educated. Right. And so that's kind of more of her, her mentality. And then she's also like, she doesn't have the, I don't want to sound bad, but she doesn't have the desire to, to teach necessarily, because I think she's like, she looks at it. She's like, I, I don't like, I, I don't feel like she doesn't feel like she has the patience for it. Yeah. You know, and uh, but she certainly has the, you know, the intelligence for it. I mean, she's, you know, an engineer by trade. So uh, so that's in itself not a problem. Uh, but I look at it and I'm like, well, I know what the pub I don't know what the public or the schools were like where you went in Indonesia. But I can tell you here, the public schools are trash. Yeah, and they're not so great here. I sure as hell, like even the nice ones, I'm not even sure that I would want my son to go to. Yeah, it's um. so the homeschooling thing, I I definitely get like, I understand where people are when they hear about it, right? Mm -hmm. And first, your life has to be configured in some sort of way to even be able to do it in right. the first place. Some person needs to be at the house really yep. to make it work. Now, there are ways to finagle that, right? There's pods and, and like uh, mm -hmm. local little homeschool groups that you can set and your kids too, that are going to be better than some of these bigger institutions. But it's a whole world that you right. have to kind of break into and you got to get to know people. Yeah. And there's like a trust element there because you're working with their kids or they're going to be looking after your kids. Mm -hmm. There's a, it's a whole big thing. And there's like a definitely a heavy lift for getting into it, but it's really just life. Right. Like the, what it boils down to is you're just going to be there with some kids or with your right. kids. And the, the, dynamic shift and how that affects your life is really not so great. I mean, people have been doing it for a long time. And mm -hmm. when looked at through the lens of like managing a career and modern, modern modem, modern life, it's definitely mm -hmm. a different thing, but you get into it. People have gotten into way harder things than just homeschooling. It's a, but it is like a change. You'd like ch change your mindset right. into like a teaching one. And it does require kind of some, some, development of procedures to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. But I think anybody can do it. Yeah. Anybody with a kid. My, my mom homeschooled my brother and my sister. I, I, she didn't homeschool me because by the time she was interested in it, I was already like a sophomore or maybe a, a junior in high school. And so it was a bit late to kind of shift things. And I had already shift, I had already shifted a little bit. And because of that shifting had um, been set back a year. Because I went to this, uh, they, they put they did put me in a private school which used an entirely different system, and the way they structured it is that you would get tested if you came in midstream, and then whatever you, they didn't feel that you tested high enough on, they would send you back to do, and so then I was end up like for the for an entire year I was basically doing what they what you might call makeup work, so I wasn't really mm -hmm. doing the work for my level, and that that was like. In ninth, I think it was in 10th grade, and then I did my first 11th grade there too, and then we left, and I went back to public school, and instead of being a, a senior, I had to go back and be a uh, junior again. Yeah. So it was kind of weird. So I had already kind of got kind of got shortchanged a little bit, I guess. It's a little <laughs> bit demoralizing, not right. necessarily because of like a, a ranking of intelligence thing mm -hmm. at all, but just like just being bounced around when you're right. a kid you're like trying to just you just want to be there with your peers or whatever and right. doing the same thing as everyone else rarely do you want to stand out as right. a teenager <laughs> yeah no right <laughs> you just want to hide in the shadows and then just getting bounced around for all this weirdness and right. showing up at a different grade than you think you are definitely could be like a a weird feeling i think that's kind of the way the whole whole system works though a little bit it's become a little bit too institutional mm -hmm. right kids are just kind of in there and there's far too many kids in any one of those organizations for them to be receiving some sort of attention that actually meets their needs. And right. the odds that any kid in any public school is properly configured to learn best via a public school curriculum are extremely slim, right? That's like a right. 
prescript thing that is based on someone's ideal of the way a person would learn, but does not actually have any right. basis in, in behavioral science. So it's just not the way that if you watch your kid growing up around your house, they learn by shoving things in their mouth, right? right? Like they're, yeah. they're creatures that just want to experience. That's all right. that they want to do. They just want to get out there and do stuff. And the public school curriculum just tries to make everyone a generalist. Right. And humans have never been generalists. And right. The, it's the fact that we specialize that has gotten us to where we are right now in the first place. Right. You know, it's funny. My wife, uh, my wife and I were talking a while back about, because I was a problem child, if effectively. And I was constantly getting in trouble. And then we've known some other people that had children that were kind of, you know, boys. It's almost always boys. I mean, sometimes there's girls, but it's usually boys that are like this, right? And she has this theory. She said she thinks that there's a lot of boys out there in particular who... Um, they, they, they get looked at as if they're bad kids or they're problem children, you know, but really she said, I think they just need problems to solve. Yeah. They don't have problems to solve. And so the work that, that that's given to them is boring. It's like, read this, but that's not really a problem to solve. And so therefore they're uninterested and then they do something that interests them, which is usually not what people want them to do. Yeah, it's something wild or destructive. And it does make sense, right? Like you think you're a caveman, you're 15 years old, you're probably 15 years away from when you're intended to die, right? right. Like eaten by a mountain with, from infection or something. So like, developmentally, like a 15 year old boy sitting in a school is like at prime fighting a war age, right? He right. wants to be out there like hunting, or he wants right. to be building something around up in his community or for himself or kind of getting on with his life or dealing mm -hmm. with things that actually need attendance to in the real world. And nothing about sitting in a classroom is satisfying right. at some deep and visceral level. It just doesn't work. Right. Yeah. yeah I mean, and, it, and it's, it's sad because I think that, uh, I think I personally believe that little boys are being extremely shortchanged when it in the education department. Um, because like, I, I think they need to, I actually think they need more recess in, in, I mean, if, if I were in charge of public schools, I don't know that they would be super duper great, but I would like to think that they would run a little better because I would be like, look, we're scrapping half of this nonsense of like, you're going to sit for yeah. eight hours and just take instruction. I'm like, that doesn't even, that sounds terrible. It's terrible. It's not how people learn and it's definitely not satisfying. And you only get to be a kid once, right? right. Like you should be playing with other kids and yeah. living some sort of a good life right. that you're going right. to be able to look back on fondly. No one ever is going right. to look back on that fondly, or at the very least, it's not going to be the right. pinnacle of their life. I, I hope. Right. <laughs> I please, no. I would no. like for that not to be the best that it got right. for any of those kids. And, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of, th I think there's a lot of things that can teach children along the way that's enjoyable so like my son loves to come out and work on my tools like i was saying earlier that he tried to drill the speaker and not every experiment works right so i mean there, there's an interesting comic i don't remember what the, the title of the comic is but it's it's always the same it's like this kind of like outline drawing of like a dad and then he has like kids or something like that and i can't remember the title of it but there's this one where he's giving his daughter some tools. She's like, Hey, can I go, can I use your tools for something? And then like a neighbor is like, Oh, this isn't going to work out so well. No, this isn't going to be, this isn't going to end well. That's what they said specifically. This is not going to end well. And the guy says, uh, he says it may not start well, but it'll, it'll end great or something like that. Right. And then in the next scene, you see that the that same person is like, you know, 30 years older, he's like old. And then the daughter comes in and she's like, I'm done fixing your roof, dad. You know, and, and I feel like that's that's the best way to, to teach kids is to let them explore. So this is why I went and I was like, all right, son, I'm sorry. I, in fact, I was the one that told you you could play with the the uh, the drill while it had a drill bit in it. You know, so like clearly I can't it's, it's not appropriate for me to be mad at you when you do something that you don't know any better. I mean, he did. He wasn't being malicious. And but but he learns, you know, like like he knows what a tape measure is. And he'll, or a, a ruler. And so like, he'll come, like he came in today when I was doing some stuff and he grabbed a tape measure and he grabbed the ruler and he's like, I'm going to measure, I'm going to measure. And he like puts this up, you know, puts the, the tape measure up to something. And he's like, and I'm like, is it, is it proper measurement? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> right. And I mean, he's, he's three. So he understands what this tool is. He, I don't want to say he understands what it does, but he, he gets it. Like there's, there's this thing called measure that you do with this item. Yeah. 
I'm going to measure. Now, he hasn't learned what measurements is or how to, you know, identify or read it and all, and all that. But, but he's already got this core understanding of like a hammer is to bang on stuff, a screw, uh, you know, screws into, you know, the wall or the wood. So he understands some of these things already about how tools and stuff work. So he's getting mechanical, you know, training right now at the age of three. Actually, yeah, it's, that, it's super fun to watch him figure those things out too. Oh, yeah. Because, like, for a for a kid of that age, he'll see you use it, right? And for to him, he has no no conception of what it is exactly that it's right. doing. He just knows that you're grabbing this thing, you're putting it up on the wall or whatever you're doing, making some marks. There's some aspect of this tool that the slinky looking thing right. that you can just craft things out of, right? There's some yep. some element of this thing allows you to bring to order all the random spare parts that are sitting next to your Ikea thing or whatever. Right. And it's pretty fun to watch him figure that stuff out. My son did the same thing with the stud finder. Now he's still a little obsessed with the stud finder. Mm -hmm. But when he first saw it, obviously I had no clue what a stud is, but he did know that they were in the walls and whatever right. they were, this thing could find them without seeing them. Right. So he was, thought it was the absolute coolest thing that there ever was. And for yep. just years, he was obsessed with the stud finder, running it across the walls, would find the studs, let me know every stud that was in the wall while I'm up there trying to do some other project, right? Standing right. up on a ladder, he's like, there's a stud over here. You got to immediately turn around and look at the stud that's in this wall. It's hilarious. I love it. They, they don't know, but they right. know that somewhere in that wall is the magical stud and this thing wirelessly finds them. It's yeah. fun. And that's the way that kids should be learning. You know, they should go out and kind of explore and have fun with things and see their parents do it and crafting things and bringing right. the world to order with these tools. But you don't really get to do that in the normal public school curriculum. It's kind right. of way too, way too prescript. And it really wouldn't work in the first place. Can you imagine the chaos of just handing a bunch of kids a hammer in a classroom and they right. just tell them to figure it out? <laughs> it doesn't allow for it. Right? Right. It's no. not how people are designed to learn. It just can never lead to success. Yeah, I was a terrible student, man. I, I was one of those that just was not geared for that kind of right. learning at all. Terrible student, terrible grades, got out of high school just did horrible with college and then just joined the army because it was literally the only thing that I could possibly think of doing. Right. And it was probably the only thing I was qualified for anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was a good decision for me because from there I like, you know, I learned with my hands. I learned like right. uh, I was uh, in electronic warfare and I got to kind of do stuff that was relatively technical. Mm -hmm. uh, that I would have never been able to figure out if I was trying to look at it from the books in some prescript way of figuring out the math first and the science second, but getting right. out there doing it, it was great. Learned just by experience and then was able to, to get out. And that's basically been the trajectory of my life since then. I've done that kind of work forever. Now my wife and I, we build giant radio systems all across the country, which is oh, pretty wow. cool. But so, that's the way you should learn with your hands. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it makes... I think it makes learning other things a little bit easier because you kind of grasp this concept. So like I'm willing to bet that when my when it comes time for my son to actually learn about like say a tape measure, you know, understanding, you know, mark here and a mark there and you know th there's some sort of distance and we're identifying, you know, that distance for some particular reason, you know, for you know whatever whatever purpose that is and then you know, understanding the numbers. I think the number, I feel like the numbers are going to become a little bit easier because he's kind of already got this, this very generic foundation. Like I will be, I, I, I'm trying to think of how to very generically describe it, but I will be identifying a distance between this point and this point, And I'm going to be using, you know, these representations, of, you know, of things called numbers. And then yeah. here's how I, you know, start doing some maybe calculations and whatnot and, and breaking this this down so I have these different increments, you know, half inch, quarter inch, and so on, so on and so forth. So I feel like it'll probably make it easier for him um, just because I think that little boys, one of the, well, at least for me, and, and I'm kind of extrapolating a little bit, but I think that uh, when I don't feel like, when I don't understand the purpose of where, what we're doing, where we're going, it makes... It usually, I'm usually a lot less interested, and when I'm not interested in something, uh, I don't pick up on it very well. And mm -hmm. I feel like there's probably a lot of little boys that are like that. Like if they have interest in it, you know, which usually entails, okay, why am I learning this? Where are we going? It's the, it's the infamous question in class: 
when am I going to ever use this algebra, right? Like, when am I going to use this in, you know, in real life? And then the teacher usually doesn't have much of an answer. You know, uh, if you want to go to college, then you'll need this. <laughs> well, okay, well, that's not really, yeah. that's not really using it, you know? And so I think it makes it more difficult to understand because people just tune out. Yeah, things can't be eternally abstract. Right. They, they have to relate to your life somehow. And there are people that are, are crafted for that, mm -hmm. uh, that are academics, right, right? Or, or intellectuals. I'm not one of them, um, but they're out there, I'm sure. Actually, well, my wife, who I'm pretty sure is a genius, she, she's definitely one of them. And mm -hmm. good for her, right? She right. talks about having enjoyed school like she enjoyed getting the good grades and doing the work. And now she's just a phenomenal and meticulous worker in a way that I can't possibly understand. But, uh, you know, those types of people are few and far between the really the people right. that should be the academics or the intellectuals, the majority right. of people, they should really just be out there living their lives and learning by experience. And I guess that's the whole, the whole, uh, school thing. I mean, even, even all the way up to high, higher education, we have kind right. of a funnel right now that just says every single person needs to go do it, the very same thing. Just get in there, get your college degree and get back out, figure out what you're going to do with it. You end up with the majority of the population who probably should have gone to trade school or right. stayed home. Well, I mean, that'll be more controversial, stayed home with their family. Right. That will never have even been made aware that that was a realistic possibility. Right. Because there seems to be this prescribed pathway for everyone to follow of go to high school, go to college, get your degree. Then I guess you work at Starbucks mm -hmm. really because everybody else has the exact same degree that you do. But that's just because the, the minority of people are the intellectuals, the people that should actually be going to college and doing those things. You know, they're, they're geared for it. Most people then just need to be out there doing stuff. Right. And, and I think the other thing is I actually enjoy reading, right? So I've probably learned two or three times as much after having left high school as I did during high school. I mean, aside from maybe the core things like, you know, learning how to read, um, which actually I, I think my mom taught me how to read before I went to school. But, but things like, you know, multiplication, division, stuff like that, you know, so, so I think there's some core things that I, I did learn in school, um, or somewhere between school and my mom. And, um, but as far as the things that you don't really learn from home, that you do learn from school, I bet that I've learned two or three times as much after having left school, because I just, uh, you know, I read on my own time when I find something interesting. And when I find a writer who piques my interest or now it's video right so now you might find a video that's really interesting you're like man I, I, people love jordan peterson mm -hmm. right so they might watch some of his lectures and they're learning you know because they found something that interests them at the time that they're you know th that that maybe they needed to be interesting to them or whatever so I, I i think it's i think it's unfortunate this the system that we have um and then that doesn't even talk about all the craziness that happens in schools you know like <laughs> I don't know. It's I swear to God, it feels like once a week I see a video and I'm like, that just reinforces why I don't want my kid to go to school. And I'm not talking about like, should we teach him this or that? I'm talking about like kids beating each other up. Yeah, just behavior. Violent, yeah. Just like terrible behavior. Yeah. So side by side with all the school stuff, uh, which which causes a lot of problems because you know, kids are, kids want to learn by experience. They get sent into a place where they can't really do that. And that definitely ends up with a lot of people coming out of the education system or while they are in it, really having a deep feeling of purposelessness. Mm -hmm. So when, when you hear about kids just with massive mental problems, one, to some extent, that is a result of parents being less present with their children. Right. And, and to the other extent, that's because kids are being shoved into systems that are dehumanizing, right? That don't right. attend to them as individuals that deserve to have some experience of life, but rather just to be trained in the same way as everyone else. So you get kids that act out in schools. And then outside of that, we, we have, we have a lot of, well, it's phrased in one way. I would say it is a lot of breakdown of individualism, uh, that is masked as celebrating individualism. So there is a lot of right. out in the culture, especially directed at younger people a lot of messaging that claims to treat them as individuals with respect, 
but which in reality simply gets everyone obsessed about the exact same things. Mm -hmm. And none of those things are really healthy to be obsessing about. So their, their whole off time, especially if they're active and with the internet or a cell phone, you know, kids are going to be as they do, they're going to obsess over whatever it is that they can have access to that is easily digestible and interesting. And unfortunately in the world of Instagram or TikTok, none of that is going to be particularly healthy. And then they're going to take that to school. This, Right. This misapprehension of the way that the outside world is configured, and they're going to try to apply those same values that they're being taught on social media to whatever social interactions they're having in their school. And then you're going to combine that with the lack of social interaction that some of those kids are having or the lack of ability to be reasonably moderated because they don't have a normal life outside playing in the park with other kids. Right. right? It's just this this weird reality. And yeah. Yeah, I would imagine kids are living some weird lives right now, man. It's going to be interesting when my son gets to be, I don't know, maybe 10, maybe even sooner than that to see how big, because we try to, I try to raise them a bit on the old school side, you know, so I'm like, get outside, go play as much as I can and try not to give them too much TV time. Um, you know, I mean, right now it's a little, uh, we're still a little bit in the middle of winter here in Florida, which is basically like 50 degrees har har laugh laugh at everybody that's <laughs> up north they're like okay really you call that winter yes we call that winter and i don't want to be out so um but once it's warm again i you know i wanted to be outside playing going to the the, the uh, not the gym but the um the park interacting with kids i mean even at his birthday party right like some kids were like are we going to open presents i was like no and i was like go play i'm like <laughs> my son doesn't normally get to be around like 20 kids you know in the park with a huge um bounce house and i'm like i don't care like he ain't gonna i mean we're not gonna open all the i mean at most we would like unwrap the gifts we're not gonna actually open them so there's no point and then every kid's gonna ooh and ah and i'm like i don't know there's plenty of time to do that some other time i, I, I want you to go and run and tumble play you know wear yourself out i want to see some some sweaty heads you know what i mean like to me that's yeah. part of being a kid is that running around and in, 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 you know, figuring things out with the other kids, like, Oh, he jumped on me or whatever, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in, in five, 10 years, because I feel like kids are, you know, I, I hate to sound like that old stodgy guy. That's like back in my day, we went outside and we were happy with a rock and a stick, you know, like, but in a sense, I think there's a certain value to getting outside, getting some fresh air. And it, I, I, well, I look at it, say climbing trees, doing all that stuff. I think that builds a little bit of resilience about the world yeah. around you, right? Yeah, because you're like, does. I can do this. I can do that. Uh, you know, even things that maybe they're not supposed to do, you know, like, I don't know. I can't think of anything at the moment, but I'm sure that when he gets older, he'll, him and his friends will be out and they'll, There'll be something that they'll want to do and just kind of test it out and see what happens, right? Like, I think those are good things as long as it's not too crazy. You know, it's it's a good thing. No, uh, do some of the crazy stuff too, especially oh, since yeah. he's a boy. But right. yeah, I mean, that is that is how you know, right? You test the, the parameters. You yeah. push up against the walls so so you can learn where the limitations are and what you're actually capable of and what you're right. not. And there's not really been uh, that much time since people were just banging things with sticks for much to have changed physiologically, right? So a right. lot of the a lot of the subsystems that are in place there within people are still really geared for that kind of tactile experience. Right. You're supposed to be out there and experiencing the world and learning about it by by being in it and being mm -hmm. in it with other people so you can see what their abilities are and learn what your abilities are. And the problem is when, well, there's a little bit of a dopamine system thing going in the background there that's getting messed with pretty heavily via cell phones. Right. But uh, if once you throw that into the mix, there's not much of an incentive to go out there and do that. So you're kind of getting this, this feeling that you're getting that experience by looking at the phones or looking at the screens or whatever instant gratification that just burns out your endocrine system at a very young age. Right. And then you're left with a lack of that experience. Once you go out into right. the real world, you don't really have that understanding of what your own abilities are. And yeah, it's, it's tough, but yeah, I think that's the way it, does make you sound a little bit stodgy. Everybody does when they say, I just get outside and get some tree sap on your hands or whatever. But right. <laughs> and at times, um, definitely as a dad, 
I find myself saying the old timey things and mm -hmm. just realizing how corny I feel for saying them. Right. And a big part of like learning how to get over myself a little bit was that like, you were never really that special, man. When, <laughs> when all those people out there were saying those things that you just right. thought were so stuffy and old, right. like here you are now and you realize they're all just right. Right. That's right. just the, it was as simple yeah. as that. Like you were not smarter than the 300 years of people before you, no matter how much right. you wish you were. Right. And like now, you, now you're saying the same things your grandparents were saying to you and yep. for good damn reason. Right. <laughs> because that's what promotes like a happy, a happy life. Just right. those simple things. And that's not just with that, man. That's like with everything. That's just with living my life with my family. These kind of weird traditional mm, things that you, that you do with your family, like, like normal mom and dad type relationship roles that you accept that mm -hmm. feel just so stodgy and weird, but really are just like, that's just the way it is. That's what feels best. It's what's natural. It's what you should do. And you, I mean, you're really not special enough to be able to fight it, fight it. Right. No, it's, it, it's interesting. And I, and I, I, I look forward to seeing his development and then just observing it compared to peers that maybe had a different development and just kind of see, uh, I, I, you know, you were talking about the, um, the dopamine and the endocrine system and stuff like that. And it seems to me that, you know, getting out in the world, um, and for lack of better phrasing is kind of similar to like a, a, a profit and loss type system, because if you're playing a video game, there's not really any threat, right? So whatever benefit you get, whatever gain you get, you know, ex excitement that you get from doing something, I feel comes without any kind of threat that you have to overcome or any kind of, you, you, um, I don't know if I'm phrasing it correctly. So if you, if you follow what I'm getting, then, then definitely, you know, chime in. But when you go outside and you're like, well, I want to, you know, your, your buddy's like, I bet you can't climb that tree. Right. And then you're nervous and you're scared, but your buddy's kind of dared you to. So you climb the tree and then you realize, wow, I can climb the tree, right? So there's this gratification that you get for having done it. But along the way, you had to accept the fear and the trepidation of actually doing it right. or the fear and trepidation of of your friend, you know, giving you a hard time for not doing it. So I feel like those kind of things balance each other out, right? Whereas yeah. you don't get that from just sitting indoors all day. It's absolutely the case. I mean, there's a cost at things, right? And like, the, the well, it's a value proposition. Ultimately, how much do you value the thing that you get on the other end of it? And you're right. probably going to value it personally. I'm not making mm -hmm. a labor theory of value argument here. Sure. But you're probably going to value it personally based on how hard it was for you to get it. Right. Right. You're, well, at least you're going to appreciate it more, especially right. as a kid, like getting to the top of the thing, getting climbing to the top of the tree after you've like scraped your knees up, falling down eight times. It's going to feel right. way, way better than oh, yeah. if you just were able to look up and just get up there easily. You've got to have a hurdle to overcome. I think to some extent that's because people are problem solvers. That's mm -hmm. what scratches the itch for humans. Right. You know, you're supposed to be getting bugs out of a tree with a stick mm -hmm. you're, or at the very least. You're not so far from a stage in evolution when that's what you were supposed to be doing. So it still feels good to do it. And that's like a meticulous and a time consuming thing that leads to probably a pretty small payoff, but it doesn't really matter what the payoff was. It mm -hmm. just matters that you were able to successfully do it and that you probably scraped yourself up along the way. There's definitely something there. And uh, that is definitely for kids, especially super critical for them, oh, yeah. to, for them yeah. to be able to go out and solve those problems that are difficult and to do it and know that they did it of their own accord mm -hmm. and it's their accomplishment gives them some ownership, gives them some oh, ownership yeah. over uh, the thing that they did, but also lets them feel like they have some command and control of themselves. You oh, know, yeah. they understand what they're capable of. They're probably not expected to climb many trees in the average business world, I would imagine, but the experience of knowing what you can and cannot do is, is definitely priceless. Right. I mean, I see it already in my son because one of his, he, you know, he has some stock phrases that he says a lot. Um, I mean, at, at appropriate times, but one of them is, I did it, you know, and, and it could be over something significant, you know, you know, that we know is, was a bit of a challenge for him. And sometimes it's something that he's done, you know, a hundred times already. And he just gets excited about knowing that he can do it. And then I think that the fact that he he did it right like he you know he accomplished something 
drives him because he is constantly like, I'll do it, I'll do it. That's his other phrase. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it for everything. And sometimes it's, you know, you're like, all right, look, we're trying to get ready and go, buddy. We, we don't have time for you to, you know, to try to lace your shoes, which we, we know that you have not yet accomplished. And, you know, <laughs> you're 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 still a few months away from right and, and it's not that we don't want him to learn it's just like hey right now can we leave because we're running late already <laughs> you know and he's like no no i'll do it and we're like well okay and then we just it's wait. so much better than the alternative so it definitely uh, is and uh so we'll wait and, and you know and he doesn't always get things but uh but he enjoys having the opportunity to do things and so the way we treat it is i'm like as long as we can allow him to do something safely, pretty much anything is up for grabs. Now, there are some things that are completely off limits. So like if I'm outside working, I'll let him play with uh, an old uh, drill that I have. I, I gave him an old drill, and I actually even made him a small workbench that he has and uh, put some bolts on there and stuff like that, and I give him some some actual tools like wrenches and whatnot. And so he has a an old uh, drill that he'll, he'll go out and he'll just – drill stuff all over his table but like the the power saw the other uh, table saw okay he don't get to touch that at all not 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 plug it in not turn it on not even touch it when it's off like don't touch the table saw period right so there are some things that are off limits but otherwise i'm like well you know if i'm watching him which i should be I'm like well why not let's give it a go and see what happens you know, and then sometimes he drills in a speaker. <laughs> well, that's all right. That's a small price to pay. Yeah. So, and honestly, I'm like, I found it, I found it very, you know, I think I would be neurotic. Complete, I mean, I already am, but I think I'd be even more neurotic if I was worried about all the things that he might do that were wrong. And so I've kind of resolved it in my mind that there are a lot of things that I just don't care because I'm like, you know what? That's what three-year-olds do. So like if he's drawing on the wall, we, we'll stop him if we catch him. We'll say, hey, no, 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 you draw on paper. But we don't make a big fuss out of it, right? It's like, look, don't draw on the walls, you know. Um, like, hey, stop it, you know, just like a really quick, simple, but we don't make a big fuss of it, right? Because I'm like, eh, I can repaint the wall and I'll probably make him help anyway. So whatever, you know. <laughs> and, and, and I feel like that's helped out and allowed me to not interfere with him exploring his independence because i think otherwise i might i might be like no don't do that don't do that don't do that don't do that and then like he would get the lesson like okay independence is not something that's promoted here yeah it's i have the opposite problem i'm way too strict and i know <laughs> it. I, I know it. it's 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 my big it's my big issue but like I, when i was a kid growing up i had no rules mm. and that was what got me into all the trouble that i got right. into and, and like I always have to, I find myself teaching Nico. I'm always balancing between punishing my childhood self right, <laughs> and actually imposing reasonable rules for him. And it never right. stops, right? That's like right. always going on in my head. I like to think about saying a thing then I have to think about it. Am I like, am I just overdoing this so that I'm overdoing it as some recompense or is this actually a proportional response to the thing that's going on? Right. Yeah, it's like a constant, constant thing. Always have to be analyzing and determining what is the appropriate. But I think I always fall on the side of strict. I think gotcha. I do. We're like a bed making. Gotcha. With a, every morning, that kind of thing. But it's not. I'm just. That's my personal experience, you know. Yeah. And I, I guess we're... also he's he's at least biologically is more likely to be like me than right. some random right. kid. So yeah. it is probably if you're thinking about it from just a reproductive or familial mm -hmm. standard might make sense. Right. Might make sense that you would attend to your children in the way you would have attended to yourself. Because right. Because they're That's more likely to be like the old you. Right. I, I, it's weird because I, my wife thinks I'm the more disciplinarian type. And, and I can be. because so, so I think I try to give him a lot of latitude. But for the things that, he, that I don't want to give him latitude on, I think that's where I kind of come down on the strict, like, hey, don't do that. Like, you, you know, and, and I think part of it is because I've kind of narrowed it down and said, all right, these are the things that you, that I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be flexible on. So therefore, since I've already made that decision, that's where I need to be flexible. But then these other things where I'm like, all right, I'm not going to be flexible. Like if he goes to turn on, like let's say I'm outside working and he goes to turn on the, the table saw, yeah, he's going to get yelled at, 
right? Yeah. I'd be like, hey, you stop that now. And I, you know, I might even smack his fingers or his hand or something like that, uh, which I know all the all the peaceful parents <laughs> that might be watching are going to cringe and have, you know, have a fit, but that's okay. I will deal with that, whatever, as long as he doesn't chop his hands off, right? So, uh, you know, I, I, I think I do kind of fall in that in some ways, but in other ways, I don't. And yeah, it does make sense. I definitely have the hard and fast things that are like, uh, I have things where I'm just like, if it ever happens, you stop it immediately and mm -hmm. just make sure that it is clear that that is like a hard wall that you've yeah. just approached. Yep. And there are things where you have a reasonable response. Yeah. And then there are things where your response should be a little unreasonable. And there is, and I was, I was just talking to him about this the other day. They're, they're always, almost always only going to be safety issues, right? They're going to be right. like, not not grabbing our hand before you go into the street or just running right. into the street to cross a parking lot or something like those are going to be things where like I, i'm going to yell at you right it's right. going to be scary but yeah it's for a reason yeah yeah i don't i'm trying to think i can't think of a time where i mean maybe if something happened and it was all in this in the moment where i got a little bit upset a little quickly but as a rule of thumb i don't think i really get upset over things that if I said you'd you'd be like, yeah, that's what little boys do. They 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 scribble on the walls. They, you know, they'll they'll draw on your tile. They'll you know, they'll take the markers and they'll pound them on the, you know, on the, uh, on the paper until the until the felt the felt tip is no longer usable. <laughs> like they just like little boys are just hard on things or destructive, mm -hmm. and uh and and they explore all over the place. You know, all over your walls and whatnot. And so it's, it's just interesting, like, now that I think, you know, now that you mention it, to think about, like, how much of that am I really doing for him? Or is it really that I'm doing it for me? Yeah. <laughs> or somewhere in between. And I don't think it's a bad thing. Almost, almost certainly some percentage right. of it. If you're right. like, if you're trying to think about how you think of you, it might not even be how you actually were. Right. It might just be how you think of you. Right. But some percentage of it is almost definitely going to be that. And that's, I think, is probably normal and good. Right. You know, your kids are likely to be like you, although right. hopefully. Well, <laughs> my kids are likely to be like Amy. Please God. Right. Yeah, well, yeah. It will be. He will be much better off if he's more like his mama than me, at least in some ways, right? Um, because I was constantly in trouble. I constantly was getting hurt. Uh, my poor mom. Like, you know, I, I, I bit my tongue almost entirely off when I was like four, or five, something like that. And I had to have it sewed up without anesthesia because <laughs> I, I, I had some medical issues going on at the time. And so they couldn't give me anesthesia. So there I am in the operating room with my mom and my dad in there. You know, they don't even know what happened. Like nobody to this day could tell you what happened. They just know that all of a sudden, you know, I was out on the porch and, you know, the back porch, a screened in porch. And then the next thing they know, I'm screaming and then there's blood pouring out of my mouth. And they're like, what the hell? You know, and uh uh, you know, it, it, I mean, that was probably the most extreme, but I constantly did stuff like that. I was constantly yeah. getting hurt in some way where they had to rush and attend to me. And I didn't learn from the prior lessons like ever. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm, 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 no one who has boys is going to enjoy hearing this, but I think that that is right. just the way it is to have boys. At some point, oh, yeah. they're going to hit that age where the testosterone is going and they want to do yep. the crazy things. And yep. there's very little that you're going to be able to do to stop it. Yep. I, I, I've, I've joked with my wife. I'm like, you're going to get it one day. You're going to hear, look, mom, watch this. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you're going to know whatever you're about to look at. You're probably also going to cringe about it as well, you know, and that's just like, that's the way it is. Like, you know, and uh, maybe, you know, hopefully he doesn't get hurt, you know, in any significant capacity, obviously, like, you know, I still want him to explore and, you know. If he gets a little hurt, that'll be okay. No big deal. Yeah, it's it's better so. to be out and doing those types of things. And you just hope that when they're at that age, like that the due diligence that you had put in in having those hard walls, like right. the safety things, the, yeah. those scary lessons to learn, you hope that the due diligence that you had put in and teaching those lessons harshly right. finally resonates when they yeah. are in a position on their own where they are able to really explore the boundaries. And right. I think that for the most part, the fact that any humans still exist is proof that that does work. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think it's good. I, I think it's always good. Just do your best. And I like to say children are pretty resilient, actually, from my observation. Yeah. <laughs> Nearly um, indestructible. Yeah. So um, I think he's got a long, and he's pretty cautious anyway. So I think we're, I think we're, you know, knock on wood here. Uh, I think we're, you know, in good shape that he's relatively cautious when he climbs. Like he's always the, the three point of contact climber type. You know, like, so he'd, 
He doesn't really do a lot of daring stuff right now, but it could change. It could change. We'll see. We'll see what happens. So I got a question for you because I know you're also a member of the Libertarian Party. Oh, yeah, sure. So how does being a Libertarian impact you as a dad? Hmm. Um, well, it's probably not going to be the anticipated answer, but um, it, it definitely is going to be the biggest distraction from me being a dad, especially being involved in, in LP politics. And, you know, Amy <laughs> and I are involved right. in the politics at the national level, too. And, right. Um, not it. It's not going to I'll give you what you're really looking for here in a sec, which is how does it inform it? But uh, it, it acts as probably one of my largest distractions. It is okay. the thing that I have to moderate the most mm, to make sure that I'm giving my my son the kind of attention that he deserves, because the, the LP politics stuff and the, and the libertarianism in general, even the social media culture that surrounds it can be very engaging mm -hmm. and it can absorb a lot of your time and attention right. very easily. Yep. It's I like, can attest uh, to that. it's like fast food, you know, right. <laughs> you really have to moderate around it. So I have to set some pretty hard and fast boundaries and, um, it gives me another thing to think about, to make sure that I'm doing a good job. Um, how does it inform the way that I teach him? Or just in uh, general, like just an impact that you had, that it has. Yeah. On so, um, it definitely, I am kind of trying to teach him the baseline lessons about the reality of the world so that he has some deeper understanding of the political mechanisms that lead to the kind of cultural discordance that we have mm -hmm. today sooner than I was able to get to it, right? So I only really had some fundamental understanding of what was going on at the governmental level or, mm -hmm. or some basics of legitimate economics and how they actually modified communities and culture and, and, and the market. I only had that understanding, you know, just my late twenties and early thirties. So I did not right. get to it young. So mm -hmm. I think for me, like I'm trying to really distill those lessons quickly and in some way that is palatable to a child so that hopefully he can get there sooner than I did. And maybe 15 years sooner than I did is 15 more years that you can actually be working to solve some legitimate problems. Right. I don't know, maybe something like that. I would not say that it really changes very much about the way that I teach moral lessons or anything. Okay. Um, uh, I think that a lot of how I think about the, the lessons of morality are the same mm -hmm. now as they have always been. Um, I, I recently at the very least am really starting to come around on humanizing the enemies, right? Mm -hmm. So like, yeah. um, I've, I've had a lot of experience, a lot of time here recently where I realize now that like, and, uh, I've been pretty harsh on some of the public safety community, at least internally, which is a little confusing because I'm a member of them. Right. But you, uh, that within libertarian culture is a, is a subgroup of people that people can come down really hard on and, and can right. tend to just say, you know, you've got to throw the baby out with the bathwater on that type of a thing. And I realize now that a lot of the way that that is was informing the way that I was looking at a whole huge subset of the population, right? And I was thinking of them as people that did not live deep, rich lives. They mm -hmm. were just some political mechanism of force. Right. So I, I definitely try to teach Nico that everybody, every person you're going to come across on the street has some deep and rich and meaningful experience of reality, the same as right. you do. They're all inside their head. It doesn't matter. They could be the worst person in the world, right? They could be absolute evil and they are still there, right? There's not, right. there's no human that is entirely evil. So they're still there. There's someone inside that head that's living a life. And, and while you're learning these lessons and while you're learning about the political mechanisms that lead to so much trouble, you should also know that Sometimes people know that they're doing bad things, but for the most part, people just think that they're living their lives. Right. And you it's never an easy solution. You're dealing with people. And even right. when you have to take punitive action against them, you have to, uh, you have to be able to think about the, the, the repercussions of what you're doing and you can never really come down harsh on them. Right. At least not, you can't just say, screw all these people because it's just going to take steps backwards. Right. You know what I mean? It's going to make it harder for someone who's willing to have the conversation to get across to those people in the future. Right. Yeah. 
I think I don't that's know if a very, that made sense. It did, and uh, honestly, it's probably one of the most interesting responses that I've heard, really, because I, I wasn't really looking for a stock response necessarily. Because I mean, I, well, that's I, good. I, I didn't I, have a stock response. I, I know a lot of libertarians are like, "Well, I want to teach my kid, you know, to respect individuality." Blah, blah. And I'm like, "Yeah, I would imagine that. Like, if you're if you're a libertarian and you're putting in any level of effort to fight for individuality and autonomy." then I would expect that if you're a parent, you would be teaching them the same thing. Like that just seems like it would go hand in hand. And I would be really surprised if somebody wasn't, you know, but I think it's uh, for me, especially, and I, we haven't met really, and um, you've probably observed some of the things, but I am really big about like how we communicate and engage with each other. And I think that has a huge impact on the way things play out. And, you know, and, and, and I don't want to get all biblical on people. I'm not really a religious person, but I do believe that, you know, like things like a soft answer turns away wrath. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I did a, I did a podcast episode a couple, a year and a half ago. I don't know. It was a while back. It was just a short one. I was doing this like little midweek moment where I would just talk for like five or seven minutes or something like that. And my wife had an interesting conversation with a contractor. My wife is from Indonesia, so she's visibly Asian. Right. And people that work with her obviously know who, you know, they know who she is and they know, you know, she's, you know, Indonesian. And because sometimes her, uh, she, she's not, English is her second language and she's probably like 92, 95% accurate in how she uses it. But there are times where, because her own language differs, she kind of uh, makes mistakes that, that mm -hmm. are noticeable and they're not mistakes. They're, they're mistakes that, you know, come from somebody who where English is their second language, right? So it's, it's, very, it's yeah. very clear, you know, like missing, messing up tenses and stuff like that, right? And so uh, she's talking to this contractor who she knows, and he's talking about COVID, and he's more of the Rep Republican type. And he starts saying something, you know, like, oh, well, you know, as long as, as long as it stays over there with the Chinese, I don't care if, a, you know, 5 million die or something like that. And she could have said, like, you know, well, that's a very terrible thing for you to say and give him, a, you know, a hard time about it. But that's not really her disposition, right? Like, that's just not who she is. And so she was just like, you know, so-and-so, we should always be concerned when, you know, lots of people die or something. Like that. She, she basically diffused the situation before it became one. And you could, and, I, and he was on speakerphone and I just happened to be there and I heard it. And I, I noticed that he all of a sudden just shifted. Like, there was a difference in the tone, in the perspective, and in, 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 in was he just being nice? I don't know, whatever. But there was a change in the conversation, right? And he was like, well, yeah, you're right, blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm like, this is the kind of thing that can really change the direction of a conversation, right? Like these kind of responses. Yeah. Remembering that, yeah, even though this person might have said something that's really, maybe they said something dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. When you humanize them and you talk to them, it allows for the conversation to dial back to, you know, to, to not be so, um, uh, you know, not, not to get out of hand. Right. And I feel like that libertarians, I feel like we are terrible at this. Yes. We're terrible at it. Awful at it. And it's uh, probably one of our biggest flaws and, and will be the hardest thing for us to overcome oh, if yeah. we're going to become really competitive. And that is because it is an incredibly difficult thing to be able to do because we know so much, right? right? Libertarians feel like they have this this holistic view of the way the political and cultural reality of our country, at least, and probably the world, they, they feel like they have that. So they say like, oh, well, these people are all contributing to this massive system of genocide and, and slaughter. And it's just, you know, how many, how many lives have been lost because of um, foreign interference or what, or uh, welfare, right? How many right. lives have been destroyed because of this? And, and while that's true, the, the reality is you're never going to win someone over who has contributed to that system with that argument first. You've right. got to walk them there. Right. And it doesn't matter how distasteful it is for you. It doesn't matter how much right. you personally despise that person. Right. The fact of the matter, like you, you can do it, you can be selfish and you can just tell right. them they're a scumbag, but that's going to make it harder for the next person that comes along right. who is yep. willing to have the conversation. Yeah. And it, it doesn't matter how evil the person is. Ultimately, if you want to win over, even if you don't care about them, if you want to make an impact on their followers or the people that might happen to hear the thing that you're saying, 
you've got to just bite the bullet and you've got to treat everybody as a person. You've got to right. walk them there. You've got to, you've got to hold their hand and try to get them there and, and kind of moderate the conversation without being overly inflammatory. And sure, there are times when you got to just smack somebody in the face, but they're few and yep. far between. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. I, I always say, I'm like, if you think it's time to, to shut someone down, to give them, you know, the, to really give it to them, it's probably not that time. Yeah, <laughs> you know it. It and and it happens to the best. I, I I actively try and I talk about this and I still fail sometimes. Right? I mean, I just failed the other night with a, a interaction with somebody on Twitter, and I had to kind of put the brakes on, just stop talking and give it a give it a day and just think about it. And then I then I went back and I was like, look, I think I came into this with some of my own issues, you know, based, you know, based on some things that, you know, we had talked about before that left me a bit salty. And I said, I, I was still holding on to them. And so it made me even more, I, I mean, I, I came in already kind of annoyed and now I'm even further annoyed at this conversation. So, you know, now I'm, you know, now I'm not being hospitable. And so then, you know, I, and I had to bite the bullet and I was just like, I apologize. And, and what I really wanted to do was say the old, I would have been better had it not been for you kind of attitude, right? Like, you know, that's what I wanted to say, but I was like, no, no deal. That's, that's, that's really not how it works. Like either you apologize for your own behavior outside of somebody else's or don't bother, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you can't make your behavior, uh, your apology be a conditional of them admitting something. I'm like, cause that's just not how it works. Yeah. So, I, I wish, I wish people could be more introspective. I also wish that I could be more introspective. I mean, but I think that everyone should continue to work toward that. They right. should try to continue to see what it is that they're doing in the background. Now, nobody's perfect. Right. I, right. Everybody, every once in a while, is going to get on and troll on Twitter or whatever. Sure. But, yeah. You know, as long as you're making steps to continue to try to to do better, then I think that you are positively contributing to what it is that we're all working toward. Even people that aren't libertarian, right? everybody's working right. toward the same thing. Ultimately, everybody wants the same thing in their life. Right. They just, you've got to believe that. And, yeah. and it is the case, right? There's proof that it's the case, which is the fact that we're all still here. Mm -hmm. right? Humans are like a collaborative group of people. The, at no point were things ever so bad, even during the worst times in our, in, or in our, uh, the history of our civilizations that things just stopped existing. We're here now. And that's proof that that's just simply not the case. So no matter how right. evil the people that are contributing to the woes of society today appear, it's not all going to end. You're going to be dealing with these people for a long, long time. Right. And it's only going to continue this terrible cycle. If you just, if you continue right. to come down with a, with a, a strong hand, every time mm -hmm. yeah awesome mm -hmm. well maybe your son and my son will be that next generation that comes in <laughs> you know and they're they're better able to to deal with some of the, the the hostilities and the challenges that come with other people that you know are are all too ready to butt heads yeah i so, hope so i think as a parent that's that's what you hope for yeah nothing else if there's no other goal of yours it yep. should be that your children are better than you were and you should hope that their children are better than them right and hopefully our work as we go along uh we improve it such that maybe their job isn't going to be as difficult <laughs> by the time they yeah. get here um so uh, our time's coming up it was great having you on dylan i think this was an amazing conversation i enjoyed it thoroughly so uh any final words no, man. No, thank you for having me on. Sorry for being kind of rambly at times, but oh, no, I never go great. into these things with a plan. I think that usually works out best. So sure, thank absolutely. you. Thank hey, you very much for having me. It was a great, great chat. I enjoyed it and uh, hopefully we'll do it again. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. Dylan Griffith. Uh, find him on Twitter. What is it? Uh, living Dad Joke. Is that what it is? At Living Dad yeah, Joke? Yeah, Living Dad uh, Joke. Uh, living Dad Joke. And uh, sorry that he didn't tell any actual dad jokes. Uh, <laughs> so maybe if you hit him up on Twitter, maybe he'll uh, throw one out for you. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button and connect with me at Liberty Dad on Facebook, Liberty Dad Pod on Twitter, or send me an email to LibertyDadPodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. To catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media, where the weekly episode airs Monday night at 8 p.m. 
And while you're there, be sure to check out the other free speech media shows. Prefer an audio format? Then head on over to LibertyDad.com or just search for Liberty Dad, all one word, on your favorite podcast app. Remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And I'm out.